Hi, my name is Sam Mursky, and I'm an application engineer for the MathWorks. I've been with the MathWorks now about eight years, and prior to that I worked for 14 years for the Department of Defense. I specifically worked for the Air Force um, as a civilian um, all of those 14 years. Some of those as contractors, some of those as civil service. I'm going to show you a tool that uh, I used while working for the government uh, for doing hardware loop testing, and that's Simulink Real-Time. So we're going to talk about real-time simulation and testing with Simulink. Now when you leave here today, there's a couple things that I want you to walk away with. Number one, how easy it is to go from a Simulink, a simulation and Simulink, to real-time or to a real-time application. So a little bit later, in a few minutes, I'm going to go through kind of each of the individual steps that are required to go from a Simulink model, standard simulation model, to a real-time application with Simulink real-time. That's number one. And number two, I want you to walk away is understand the power of MATLAB for use with Simulink real-time, using the scripting capabilities of MATLAB to automate your tests, to do parameters sweeps to enable you to very quickly and easily do Monte Carlo simulations with the hardware, with the hardware loop testing, with real-time applications. Even use other tools. I'll show you an example of using the optimization tool in MATLAB. Basically, any of the MATLAB tools can be used in conjunction with a real-time testing. Some of the most powerful, I consider even just the um, data analysis part of MATLAB because you can automate through a MATLAB script or function. You can automate running the test, doing some quick look analysis on the resulting data, throw any flags if anything needs immediate attention, of course, save the rest of the data for post-test analysis. And you're always in the same environment. It doesn't require maintaining multiple environments or, or shifting data from, from one environment to another. As far as real-time testing, I want to make sure we're all on the same page here. What do I mean by real-time? Real-time has lots of different meanings. Not necessarily uh, any of them are wrong or right. I just want to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. So I'm talking about, I think that one of the key words here is determinism. So if I have um, a test running at, say, um, you know, one kilohertz just to pick a round number that means that I need to sample my sensors or my inputs through I.O. I need to do the calculations and I need to send outputs at every millisecond once every millisecond and it needs to happen every millisecond on the millisecond etc with determinism the idea here is that it allows you to take your Simulink model and test that with real hardware, whether you're, you're testing an you know, embedded controller like an autopilot like I used to do for the Air Force, or if you're you know, testing a new controller like uh, to test a, like a flight motion table or motor control or, or something like that, or some sort of automated system, unmanned system, you can have this be kind of the brains for that as well. You develop it in Simulink, and then we'll show you how you go from a Simulink model to the real-time application of that. So as far as a broad overview of our agenda, uh, we're going to talk about a couple different use cases. First of all, hardware and loop. Second of all, rapid controller prototyping. And then after that, I'll show you some various ways how you can interact with Simulink real time and give examples of how I did this uh, prior to working for MathWorks. Then also a little bit more about the power of MATLAB as far as test scripting and using the power of optimization from MATLAB. And after we go through those demos, then we'll uh, I'll show you a few slides and some of the hardware that's available. So this is a complete system, a complete solution, including both software and hardware. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the hardware at the end. As far as the hardware sitting on the on my desk here, I've got a real-time machine. So this is the 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 Speed Goat mobile real-time target machine. Uh, this one is uh, nice for travel. I travel quite a bit doing these demos and so forth. So this one is somewhat ruggedized. You can see it's got these Canon type connectors here um, and um, you know, so a smaller form factor. The most common use for the real-time machine, at least in the lab environment, would be what we call the performance real-time target machine, which is a 19-inch rack mountable system, industrial type PC that you can have in a rack along with your signal conditioning and so forth. Uh, this one is sometimes used for um, in you know, uh, in-vehicle testing or, you know, testing out in the field, that sort of thing, where you need something a little bit more compact and rugged, and uh, that can also, uh, you know, run off DC power, 12 volt, 24 volt power, that sort of thing. Also on the table here, I have a device under test. This is actually multiple devices. Um, here I've got a motor that I'll use a little bit later in a, in a few minutes in, in the demonstrations. And then uh, for the first demonstration, I've got a little embedded processor mounted right here. Um, and this happens to be an Arduino Uno, just something I had handy to show testing an embedded controller with a real-time application. 
You can see also that there's a cable here connecting the I.O. card um, in my machine to the device under test and some jumpers here to go from my analog out here to the analog in uh, on the embedded controller as well as some other wires here. Uh, a bit of a kludge but this, hey, this looks like my bench used to look like, uh, you know, my previous job. So um, I don't mind having a bit of a wire kludge here. You might have a bench that looks something like this or probably a lot more, a lot more complex, a lot more wires. And so I've got, a, this is actually a serial connection. I've got a little TTL serial to RS-232 connection that's going from the embedded processor uh, through this cable um, into the machine uh, plugged in back here. Okay, so this is real-time closed loop. This is running uh, real-time. It's um, sending both the commanded position um, for the controller that might come from another device or from human input. In this case, it's coming from here, as well as the feedback from the simulation of the real of the system um, that we're emulating in real-time, and then the controller sending commands via the serial protocol. But we support many protocols. Could be you know, middle standard 1553 or 429, lots of other standards. I just use what was available here. So in this first use case, we're going to talk about uh, hardware loop testing. Uh, might call it something else, but just want to explain what I mean by hardware loop testing in this particular use case. And that is where we're going to take the controller part of the model, and we're going to have that on the embedded processor, the Arduino here in my case. And we're going to take the rest of the model, the plant model, which could be, you know, if it's a machine that you're developing a controller for, um, it could be a simulation of that machine, say like a, a robot or some, you know, device, a motor, something like that. Um, or if it's, like, say, like a flight system or a ground system, uh, the plant model here might represent the, the vehicle dynamics as well as, you know, the simulating the sensors and what those sensors would be sending back to the um, embedded system. So we're going to take that, both the commanded signal and the plant model, we're going to build a real-time application from our model and put it onto our real-time machine and then these two are going to be connected electrically with the same type of I.O. that the real embedded controller would normally be using. So the whole idea here is that the embedded controller hardware should think that it's in its operational environment. If our s simulation has uh, enough fidelity it shouldn't be able to tell the difference between that because of the not only response but also the electrical connection, analog, digital protocol, etc. as well. Just a quick picture of one of our uh, customers. This is a real system in a lab. I always like to show these real pictures because the system I have on the table is, is so simple, a uh, very simple device under test, very simple example, um, kind of, you know, almost a requirement because it's a demo, need to keep it simple. But this slide shows a, a, a realistic system, Simulink real time, uh, running on Speedgoat hardware um, in a, a, a lab. This is for a company that makes a, a jet aircraft. And in this case, they're testing a digital engine controller, a FADEC, and they're using using uh, Simulink real time to simulate the aircraft engines and you can see there's lots of types of I.O. as well as quite a few channels of I.O. So I like this slide because it just shows a, a real world example, um, you know, in a, in a real lab of, uh, from a commercial uh, customer developing aircraft. For this example, we're going to use a hydromechanical system which is a control surface on an aircraft, say an aileron on an aircraft or on an airplane, for example. So in here, these two blocks together represent the plant model. This block is the controller, this is the commanded input, and there's a position feedback to the controller. We can take a quick look at this model. Here's the hydraulics with this uh, double acting um, hydraulic cylinder being kind of one of the main components here. There's pipelines re represent losses in the pipes and, and uh, a, d a pump there. On the mechanical side, there's a, um, a push rod pushing the, the control surface itself to change the angle and uh, a cylinder which is driven by hydraulics. On the control side, a uh, very simple controller. It's a simple uh, PI controller. There's a gain proportional um, to, or yeah, a gain for the proportional, different, the error, proportional to the error, and one uh, for the uh, integral of the error. And then on the commanded, we'll see, let me just go ahead and run the simulation. And what you'll see is on the commanded angle, it goes through a series of, uh, of ramps and steps to different angles. Now, this is a visualization tool that comes with Sim Mechanics, since that was used for the mechanical part of the plant model. And uh, let's go back to Simulink and look at this aileron angle scope. You can see in magenta the commanded position, a series of angles ramping between different settings. Uh, and then the yellow is the simulated feedback from the plant or from the... Uh, the hydromechanical aileron system. So this is the, let me go ahead and plot out the results from simulation. So this line corresponds to that yellow line. It's the, the response of the system to the controller from simulation. 
Now I'm going to use a technique called subsystem variance to change this. Instead of using a simulated controller, I'm going to make a, put a hardware interface in its place. So now when I drive down inside here, you'll see the, the controller is grayed out and this hardware interface is highlighted. And this represents the I.O. between the embedded controller and the real-time simulation uh, of the plant. So here's an, like an analog output block where both the desired or commanded angle as well as the measured angle from the, the simulated plant are sent, and then there's, uh, in this case, RS-232 serial, which is received from the controller and the, is the command signal uh, to the plant. So I'm going to go ahead and click the build button here, and uh, let me just go back to slides for a second and show you what happens exactly when I, when I click that build button. It's really three steps that happen. Um, Again, to, to summarize, this is a two-computer architecture, so non-real-time computer on the left with MATLAB and Simulink, target computer hardware on the right, that's the, the, the blue Spigo box here on my desk, and that blue Spigo box, uh, you can also see video output from that. You can put scopes, line graphs, numerical displays, etc. So back to my model, when I click the Build button up here, three things happen automatically. One is that MATLAB Coder and Simulink Coder generate C code from this model. Number two, an external compiler compiles and links in the drivers and, uh, into an executable. And number three, it's transferred over Ethernet, the orange Ethernet cable here on my desk, um, from the, the, the development computer with MATLAB and Simulink to the target computer. So it's already done. It only takes a few seconds. And when I click that build button, that's exactly what happened in the background. Now I'm going to change from the default of normal mode in Simulink to external mode. So external mode, once I choose that, I have this connect to target button. And once I'm connected to the target, anything I do in the model, whether I click the, the run button or change a parameter or look at a scope, that's all happening externally on this other machine. It's like online mode. So I'm going to go ahead and click the play button. And when I do on the scope, you can see both the commanded and the feedback angle coming back in this one second window here. Uh, it's looking pretty good. So let me just plot out both now. The, re the black is a result from, from simulation, and this dashed line is the result from the hardware test that I just did. Now, they, they match so well. Um, let me just do a, a quick thing just to show you that I actually am running the controller on embedded hardware. And to do that, let me run this again just by connecting in external mode and clicking the play button. But now, as it's running, I'm literally going to disconnect the controller, and we'll see it just kind of free spin, and then reconnect it back. And let's look at those results. So here you can see when I disconnected the controller and it just kept um, you know, driving off in, into the, at the same rate it was going. And then when I reconnected the controller, it recovered and got back on track. So I just do that to show you that no smoke and mirrors here. We really are running the, the controller. We're testing a real-time embedded controller, not a simulation of a controller, with, the, with a real-time application that represents what that controller would be connected to, in this case, a hydromechanical control surface for an aircraft. Okay, for the next use case, we're going to talk about another form of real-time testing, rapid controls prototyping. Uh, you might call it hardware loop, might call it something else, but the whole idea is that we want to take this controller part of the model and we want to deploy that onto real-time hardware while we can have I.O. to connect to the real plant. So in this case, we're going to show putting the controller onto our real-time hardware that's on the table and connecting to a real piece of hardware that could be a motion flight table, it could be a um, robot, it could be a motor that you're controlling, you're developing motor controls in here. Whatever it is, the whole idea is that you connect the same way uh, with Simulink real-time as would the, the embedded controller. Of course, from this model, you can later generate you know, ANSI C code that's appropriate for any embedded processor, and that's for another webinar. Okay, so to start, let's start with a, a very simple model, of course, here. In my example, I'm simply using the DC motor that's, um, that's on my board here. Now, this DC motor is a modified servo. It literally opened up the back and ripped out the servo circuit. So it's just a DC motor with a potentiometer connected to the shaft, so we get an analog voltage that's proportional uh, to the position. And that's connected through this cable back to the real-time machine. So this is real-time closed loop, once again. And then there's the Ethernet cable, this orange Ethernet cable, that connects this machine to my laptop where I have MATLAB and Simulink. Okay, so let me go ahead and just run this model. And we can see the resulting command and feedback. Now rather than going through and showing how to tune the PID controller, I'll leave that to another seminar. I'm just going to load some tuned gains. Okay, click the play button. Now this is all in simulation, no hardware. There's the, the command in Magenta, the simulated feedback from the model of the motor here, and this is the voltage command by the controller. 
So what I'm going to do here, just for the sake of demonstration and for instruction, is delete this model of the motor. And now I'm going to build up, in other words, what changes are required to go from a simulate model with all the default settings to a model that has a hardware interface and runs in real time on our real time target. Okay, so if I go to Simulink and scroll down to the um, Simulink real-time Speedgoat I.O. driver library, in this case I'm using the I.O. 101 that's in my real-time machine connected through this cable to the real-time, to the device center test, in this case a simple DC motor. And I'm going to grab a few blocks here. Let me make a little room on my Simulink model and I'll grab a analog input for that position feedback from the motor, a digital output where we're going to send some PWM commands, and also a setup block. So I'm going to grab all three of those, create a subsystem from that, drop that sub subsystem in right, right here, and this will be my hardware interface. So let me give it a name. And let me make some room here. So Simulink really conveniently connected these lines for me, which I don't need, so I'm going to disconnect these lines. And um, how does this work? So this is the, the, the command from the controller. This is uh, in units of volts. And uh, this is the feedback that I'm going to read from my sensor, from my potentiometer. That's in units of degrees. And I need to convert this into a PWM signal that I'm going to send out over my digital line. And I need to take this analog voltage and convert this into units that the model's expecting, which is degrees. Okay, so rather than dropping all those blocks in by hand, I'm going to go to a library that I added to the Simian Library browser, the SAMLib. So you can do the same by putting all of your uh, validated and verified blocks into a library that you share with others that you use within your organization. And let me wire this up. Oops. Before I do that, let me define the channels that I'm using here. So that's what the setup block is for. Here on the analog input where I get the feedback from that sensor, I'm using channel 2, and I'm only using one channel. Now, why channel 2? It has to do with the wiring on the cable, the ICD for the cable interface control document. And I know that that sensor is, is wired up to the pin that's associated with channel 2 on the analog input. So I just know that because I know the design of the cable. You'd have to look that up if you didn't know it. And on the output, I'm going to use three channels. Now, why three channels? Two of these channels are used um, to go to each side of an H-bridge so I can reverse polarity and turn the, turn the motor clockwise or counterclockwise. Any ideas why I have a third channel? Well, the idea is because anytime you have a hardware test, you always have to have a blinking LED. So just so you know, that, so I know the test is running. Now, when I update my diagram, you'll see these, these uh, channel numbers update. This is 1, 5, and 6 of the upper block of 8, so therefore it's 9, 13, and 14 wire all this up. One more thing I need to do is set my sample rate. So a good best practice is to put a MATLAB variable, but I'm just going to hard code some numbers. 400 hertz here because the, the PID controller I have was based on 400 hertz. And 8 kilohertz here because I'm generating a PWM signal in software and I want to have some resolution on that PWM signal. Alright, am I done? Well, I've got my hardware interface block here. But um, I still need to change the standard default settings for the Simulink model. So I'm going to go to the configuration parameters. Lots of settings here. I'm only going to change a couple. One is variable step. Variable step involves going using two different orders of solver and back, going backwards and forwards in time. Great trick with uh, simulation because you can get both speed and uh, the, you know accuracy. But for hardware, we need a fixed step. We need a, a, a fixed step, time step. And this MATLAB variable is that 8 kilohertz that I mentioned earlier. On the code generation, I'm going to change from the default GRT target to uh, Simulink real time. So what this is going to do is add in extra hooks in the code, Simulink real time, so that Simulink knows when it generates the code, it puts extra hooks in the code to communicate between MATLAB and Simulink and the uh, real time application running on the Speedgoat hardware. So those are the only changes I'm going to make get all kinds of additional settings with Simulink real time under code generation, but I'm not going to change any of those. You can, you know, sync to an external clock and various other options. So I'm now I'm going to click the build button and uh, either I'll get an error or this will build. You never know. So this currently shows me that it's building. And it's done. By the way, this 142% is not the progress. That's the zoom level here. 
Okay, so I've got a couple warnings. I'm not too worried about those. I looked at them previously, and neither one is, is a big deal. It's simply a warning about uh, changing the sample time and also how to enable multi-core. Okay, so let me run this model. To do that, I'm going to switch from normal mode to external mode. Okay, now, as I said before, once I am in external mode and I connect a target like I just did there, um, now anything I do with the model is going to happen externally on this other machine. So when I click the play button, it's going to run the real-time application here. You should see the LED blinking, and you should see the motor first reset to zero and then go up to 90 degrees through this smooth step input. Click the play button now. I reset to zero, slowly smooth step up to 90 degrees, and it's done. So here on our, on our simulating scope, we can see the results. This data came back over Ethernet. And so here you can see that reset to zero. Magenta is the commanded signal. And then there's the smooth step up to 90. You can see it follows very nicely. So the general workflow that I use is I use this external mode. It's a nice way to quickly test with the model, debug with the model, using the model as your user interface. Typically, next step, once I've got this set up, I might want to do a lot of tests. There might be other engineers running the tests. I don't want people necessarily, other engineers or technicians, using the model directly. So a common workflow would be to then uh, use a GUI uh, made in Guide. It was always my favorite way to do it, since Guide is, uh, comes with MATLAB and gives you um, the ability to put MATLAB code in behind, as far as actions behind the various widgets. So I'm going to run the function here to start my MATLAB GUI. So this is a, a user interface developed with a guide tool in MATLAB. I've got some buttons up here I can connect to my target and download the application. Here when I start it, you'll see the commanded signal is a square wave, this black line. Um, it'll There it's looking a little more square. That was just because of the number of samples per second. So the black line is the commanded signal and the, the blue is the feedback. Um, in this plot we see error, so basically the difference between these two plots. And this is says motor AB, that's just the, the signals that go to both sides of that H bridge over those two digital lines. Okay, one for clockwise, one for counterclockwise. So we can see here that if I, if I grab the motor and kind of resist its motion, we can see that, that uh, on the plot here, as well as increased error. Um, I can also not only view this live as it's running in real time on my real time system, but I can also change parameters like the proportional integral or derivative gain. So you can see this has a, a proportional integral uh, controller. Let me add some a lot of derivative gain, actually trying to mess it up just so we can see the effects. So I may put this large derivative gain. You can see we get very low performance overall. And uh, I can take that back out. And we'll see the performance go back uh, to what we expect. Okay, so the whole idea is external mode, nice, great way to troubleshoot, die, do, uh, you know, get things up and working. Once you got them working and you actually want a nice test interface, you can use Guide to um, automate tests, view data, change parameters, load conditions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is just one example GUI that was built uh, in Guide. Well, what other options are there for uh, user interfaces to Simulink real-time. Well, um, there's uh, starting back in 14a, there's a Simulink real-time explorer, and so you can also have a very easy to build GUIs in Simulink real-time explorer. Let me just change the model that I have a little bit because I want a constant input. So I'm going to go back to my model, I'm going to take out the smooth step input, and I'm going to go to the Simulink sources library and grab a constant block, so I'll have a constant setting there. And um, let me go ahead and change the stop time to infinity so this runs continuously, and let me rebuild the model. So this is that rapid prototyping. Make a change, click the build button, immediately see the results. Let's do a quick check here uh, with the external mode to see, make sure the system is behaving like we're expecting. So I'll go ahead and connect to my target and hit the play button. You'll see the, the red LED blinking. And uh, you see this is at a set position. It just moved to one degree. I'll change this, say, to like 50 degrees. You see the it move when I do that. Here, let me change this back to like um, 20. Now, when I hit Enter, uh, you will see this immediately move when I hit Enter now. OK, so this looks like it's behaving like I expect. Let me disconnect in external mode. Um, and I want to have a, a user interface for this system. So let me just show you kind of how to quickly build one up with Simulink Real Time Explorer. I'm going to open a new instrument panel, and here's my model. Let me um, open up some things here. Let's see, I want to look at the signal 
inside my block here. Let me drop this down so I've got some room to build my user interface. Um, here is the, um, the feedback measured angle. So let me grab, say, an angular gauge and take a look at that signal. Just grab, drag my, uh, my widget here directly onto my canvas and then grab this uh, signal icon and drag that onto the widget. And um, let me grab maybe, say, a knob so I can change the commanded or set position. For that, let me grab some parameters from the model here. So this is a list of parameters at the top level. I'm going to grab this parameter and drop it right onto that knob. Go ahead and run this GUI. Now this GUI is running. Um, you can see here if I manually kind of manhandle the motor and, and move it, we can see that feedback there on the on the uh, angular gauge, right? As well as if I go over here to the knob and, and move this knob around. First of all, you see the, the angular gauge moving in conjunction with that as well as the motor moving to that angular position. So there's an example of how to very quickly build up uh, a simple GUI, and there's lots of nice instruments um, that you can use here to do that. If you take a little time, of course, you can make this look a lot better. Let me, let me go to a, a different example where you can see one that uh, someone put a little bit of time into, into building up. So this is a model of a car with uh, state flow for the shift logic. So I'm just going to build this model to create a real-time application to run on my real-time machine. And then let me go back to Simulink Real-Time Explorer and open up a previously built example here. Close some of these so I can get some more real estate on my low resolution screen here. And um, start this one. Actually, I do need to start the application first. So let me look at my application. So I built a real-time application from that model, but I didn't actually start the model. So that starts the model. And now, if I click the Start button on my GUI and give it some gas, you can see the RPMs just jumped up and now my speed is increasing. And similarly, if I give it some brake, well, when I let off the gas, you see it's slowly decelerating. And then if I give it some brake, it'll decelerate a little bit faster there. It'll slow down. So pretty nice looking GUI. Um, spent a little bit more than 30 seconds building this one. And it's just, as a, it's just a matter of taking images and putting the gauges on top of the images and, and, and uh, just taking some time to make it look nice. I think it looks pretty good, don't you? All right. So there's a few user interface options and kind of an explanation of, of how I would use um, the workflow from using an external mode initially, then going to a GUI, my personal preference being Guide, because I like to program in MATLAB, which Guide allows you to do. Um, let's show some of the other power of MATLAB for Simulink real time. So for that, let me um, actually go to a slightly different version of the motor model. And uh, I'll build this. Now, while this is building, I'll tell you a little bit about this model. First of all, you can see there's a couple different options for input, either that smooth step up to 90 degrees or a sine wave, discrete time sine wave. Also inside the controller, if we take a look at that, um, so the model is currently building. As soon as it's done building, I'll show you the controller, which consists also of a PID controller, but an additional element, a feed forward element, which gives it a gain that's proportional to the derivative of the command signal. So there's the discrete derivative, and here's this gain. So let me just go ahead and in external mode, connect to the target, and click the play button. And here we can see the sine wave on the scope. That data is coming back via Ethernet, so this is a connection to the, the real-time application. And we can see it's matching pretty good there. But let me let me change this feed forward gain just manually. Maybe I change this to like uh, let me just take away the feed forward gain of zero, and we'll see some additional lag that's in in the in the uh, in the system now. The controller is a little bit more lag than it did before. And likewise, if I increase above the value that it was before on that feed forward gain, we'll actually see this turns into a bit of more of a lead and also some overshoot. Might be a bit much, maybe 0.06. So maybe less overshoot, but also still leading the system a little bit. All right, so maybe what we want to do is use the power of MATLAB to go through a, a whole sweep of parameters, or you could use the same technique for, say, like a Monte Carlo analysis. 
So in my editor here, I have um, a very simple example of automating simulink real-time hardware tests uh, with a simple for loop. So this for loop just sweeps through some values from 0 to 1.2 in steps of 0.4. And uh, there's not much going on here. It's just setting a parameter, which is that feed forward gain. It's starting the simulation, waiting and stopping the simulation. Then all of this is just plotting out the data. So really, there's just a few kind of main lines here. Here's the end of the, the for loop. Let me go ahead and run this. And what you'll see is uh, the, the motor go through this smooth step motion. Got the LED showing us that the test is running. When the test is done, two plots come up. Okay, the one on the left is the command versus the feedback um, for each of the feed forward gains. So after each test, it'll put another two plots up. The other plot is simply the error, the difference between these two plots. So for example, if I were to zoom in close enough here, you'd actually see that there is a, a difference between the two plots, and this is showing that, that difference. Um, for each feed forward gain, 0 0.4, 0 0.8, and 1.2. And this is calculating a root mean squared error, which is just a simple calculation. I didn't mention that before, but here where it takes the commanded um, input, the commanded signal and the feedback, it takes the difference over the time range that we're interested in, basically on that, on that slope, on that rise to 90 degrees. And then it squares the difference, takes the average as a square root. So basically a root mean square, and, and we're showing that data um, on this plot as well. So it's a, MATLAB is a very powerful language, and you can also use it for scripting your hardware tests and also some immediate kind of quick look analysis on the results. You could even check for things being out of bounds and throw a flag, say, hey, this might need some further analysis. This is all sorts of things that I used to do when I worked for the Air Force in, in my previous career. Now, in this particular case, this is uh, just sweeping a gain value. You might be sweeping other types of values, but I'm sweeping a gain value. A gain value for a controller might actually make sense to optimize rather than just sweeping. Um, we can see here that you know, 1.2 looks pretty good, maybe the best here, if you just kind of eyeball it. But let's actually use the power of MATLAB again to optimize uh, this gain value. So to do that, I'm going to load some data, uh, not load data, but load a, a project that I saved previously for the optimization toolbox. And I'm going to go to my apps and open the optimization tool. Could have this all in a script, but just to make it a little more visual, I'm going to show the optimization tool. And uh, I'm going to import the problem, which is what I just loaded in my workspace. Basically, this, I saved the settings that I used here. And let me go ahead and get this started, and I'll show you what's going on. So this is kind of the important part. Here's the objective function, uh, which is this um, feed forward gain objective function. I could show you the code, but it's almost identical to the for loop that I just showed you. It's just not a for loop. It's letting the optimizer um, loop through various values. And what this returns is that error value, that RMS error I was talking about before. So here in the plots, this is just a plot of command versus feedback. It shows the iteration, the error for the, the previous or the currently plotted um, iteration, as well as what the feed forward gain is. Up here, this is just a plot of that um, of the error on its own. So this is the current value of the error, but here you can see the trend with the error, which is it's coming down. That's exactly what we want to do: is minimize the error between the command and the feedback. We can see that visually here, and we can see it here as as the um, you know this val error value is decreasing. Um, over each iteration. This is iterations on the x-axis for these two plots. Now this top plot shows the total number of times we've run the hardware test. Um, it's also showing um, for each iteration how many times. So initially we just ran uh, one test for the basically the first iteration. The next few iterations we ran the test twice. On this on the fifth iteration we actually ran three tests. And that, that allows the optimizer to look at the you know the the gradient of the solution space and look for you know a, a minima point so that it can reduce that error as much as possible. And uh, we can actually see it's kind of zooming in on that 1.2 value that, that looked pretty good to us before. Of course, this is rounded to only one significant digit after the decimal place. But this is exactly the kind of trend we want to see, is we want to see that error coming down and down and down. Looks like it's getting to an asymptotic type error of uh, around 0.4. Maybe it'll get a little bit lower if we let it, let it continue to run. So a couple of examples there of using the power of MATLAB with Simulink Real-Time. All these products are made by the MathWorks, so you can use MATLAB to optimize your tests, of course, do quick look analysis, um, analyze the data, all in the same environment, not have to figure out how to get data from one place to another or maintain multiple systems. So let's talk a little bit about the hardware that's used for Simulink real-time. 
As I mentioned before, it's a two-computer architecture, the non-real-time computer running MATLAB and Simulink, the real-time computer, uh, which is the other computer that you can see on my webcam here, which does have video display. You can get video display right out of the real-time computer and have line graphs and numerical plots and so forth. So what hardware is available for this? Well, I'm not going to talk so much about the laptop side but on or the desktop, but um, for the target computer hardware, the real-time hardware. This is an example of um, probably our most popular model. It's called the Performance Real-Time Target Machine made by Speedgoat. Let's talk a little bit more about Speedgoat. So Speedgoat um, develops and sells real-time target machines specifically for Simulink real-time. That's all that Speedgoat does. Um, these are machines that are optimized and tested for Simulink real-time and they're made to work together. Along with the machine, now the machine is, uh, has I.O. cards in it to meet your requirements, so this isn't like a standard machine and you get stuff you don't need. Um, it's populated with I.O. specifically based on your requirements. We have a simple requirements worksheet you can fill out so we can determine your requirements. Of course it comes with all the necessary cables, terminal boards to connect to your hardware, all of the drivers and uh, test models as well so you can get started quickly. Let's take a little bit further look at some of the hardware options that are available. This shows six of the uh, Speedgoat's uh, different form factors. Uh, this was the one I mentioned on the upper left. It's the most popular, but there are some other ones that are better for in-vehicle use. They're more compact and ruggedized, similar to the one that I have on my desk as well as some without um, frames if you know you're going to put it say in your own uh, your own enclosure and so forth so let me talk a little bit more about our most popular model this uh, performance real-time target machine it is used a state-of-the-art technology right now that's a i7 quad-core machine um, and uh, can use multi-core, multi-target, and even include FPGA application as well. Um, the machine itself can take uh, seven I.O. cards with lots of channels each, so this can literally get you, you know, hundreds of channels of I.O., but you can go up to many more, even, you know, thousands of channels of I.O. through expansion modules. You can get up to 50 I.O. cards through an expansion chassis, so they can get up to lots of real high channel counts. This is a system that was recently delivered to one of our customers, so since the system on my desk is so simple, I wanted to give you a, a look at what a real you know, industrial strength system that we deliver can be. It also can be very simple, but this, this was quite a complex system. It was a, it's a hardware loop system for an, an automated uh, ground vehicle actually used in, uh, in farming. Uh, this is a, a picture of uh, our latest version of the mobile real-time target machine, which is, as you can see, somewhat hardened. It's made, uh, say, to take in vehicle, could uh, take an aircraft or, you know, in a ground vehicle. Um, it's um, somewhat ruggedized, vibration-proof, and so forth. This also can be expanded by having extra of these layers. This shows two layers, kind of additional layers as well, and, and add up to quite a few I.O. The two layers, it can have six uh, six modules, six I.O. modules, six cards essentially with lots of channels each. As far as the type of I.O. that we cover, basically any type of standard I.O. Um, that you can think of as well as quite a bit of non-standard but certainly analog, digital. We've got multiple cards in each of these categories so that we can meet your requirements as far as you know, um, bit resolution, simultaneous sample and hold when it comes to analog or not, um, if you don't need that, um, encoders, whether it's absolute or incremental, etc. Um, so lots and lots of I.O. cards, hundreds of I.O. cards that we currently support, as well as uh, lots of protocols as well. A lot of standard protocols here like CAN and Serial, um, SPI, I2C. Also uh, some um, non-standard protocols like uh, SDLC and HDLC, these are synchronous serial protocols which are used quite a bit um, for sensors like um, IMUs, uh, uh, that sort of thing, I inertial navigation units and things like that. So um, lots and lots of I.O. support. Basically whatever your hardware needs are, there's a good chance we can connect to your hardware in the, the, uh, the standard electrical uh, way that the real system would connect. So just as a summary, once you leave here today, I wanted to make sure you understood two main things. How easy it is to go from Simulink to real-time. showed you a standard Simulink model and the steps that are required to go from simulation model to a real-time application. And secondly, the power of MATLAB with Simulink real-time for real-time testing, for hardware testing. So a couple examples of that, like the uh, simple scripting that I did for uh, parameter sweeps or Monte Carlo analysis. Also using other MATLAB tools like uh, the optimization toolbox was an example I used where I was optimizing a game to minimize error on the motor controller. 
As far as next steps, I'd suggest that you get in touch with your account manager and we get you a lot more information. Um, or you can contact Speedgoat directly. They, you can contact either one of us. We work as one. Um, if you don't know your, who your account manager is, you can always call MathWorks main, main line and just tell them you need some help. That's 508-647-7000 here in the U.S. You can also check out our website, MathWorks.com, and under Products, go to Simulink Real Time. And uh, there's the direct link there, but you can find it by navigating through products to Simulink Real Time or look on the Speedgoat website. And of course, both of these websites have uh, lots of examples of user stories, uh, both on the MathWorks website as well as on the Speedgoat website. So I invite you to check those out and uh, give us a call if you'd like some more info. We'd uh, love to talk to you about your application and, and how we can get you up and running. Thanks.